Greetings, greetings, Barker Rebels. Welcome to this week's Sector Situation video. I'm Wayne, my partner Ryan's probably wrapping up this week's market outlook, market overview. It is Sunday, February 5th, probably a little bit after 3.30 here on the East Coast. I try to keep this short, gang, because really had a major setback on recording a very extensive macro measure. Had to do it all over again, so really cost me a lot of time and uh, did the best I could to scramble to get it done again, but we want to try to get these out and other obligations are there too. Here's our trusty disclaimer. 2023. And again, please take a look at that. And please take a look at our trusty intellectual property rights notice here. And we need to get right into this video. Let me just switch our share to a different view. And then we ought to be able to pick things up on our grid view, which should be here, I think. All right, I think we got it now. So I'm going to start over here on our 12 basic <laughs> sectors, S&P, sectors on the grid I've got set up and had had for a very well very long time but I'm going to go through things fairly quickly I think I'm going to start out by highlighting some of the overbought areas right I think your tech area got up there that got a little frothy in XLK QQQ whatever you want to call it uh XLC right uh that communications got really overbought uh, let's see I think you got close to overbought in uh, the financials XLF but uh, maybe came just shy. And then XLY, the discretionary area got overbought. You can see XTN also got very overbought. So to recap, right, you could say that technology, communications, discretionary, consumer discretionary, and transports all got overbought with XLF financials get, getting pretty darn close. And I think you can see just on the charts that those for example, XTN, I mean, look at that move. And fortunately, we had some of the names in here through UOA, so I'm not complaining. But uh, again, just kind of a crazy breakout. And I think this, when you look at these, this helps you a little bit in terms of what to expect for this week. And I looked at these and I looked at a lot of other things. And of course, for macro measure, and I really feel as though we should, I think the most likely scenario is we should see somewhat of a pullback to take a little bit of the froth off the market. Now, a lot of things because of what happened on Friday in SPY, we'll just use that as our main kind of proxy, right, for charting the market. We chart the ETF so that folks can act on things a lot more easily than SPX. But even though if you look at it, if you're only near 63 on the RSI. So you did kind of take some of the froth off with that really kind of rough candle there on Friday. The fact remains that this is overdone uh, in many ways uh, when you look inside it. So one thing I flashed in macro measure where percent of stocks above the 20, above the 50 or above the 200, they're all at what would typically be peaks, right? That would see a little bit of pullback and Stocks inside of, of course, the spiders and Qs. If you look at some of those charts, they're they're you know hitting RSI readings near 80, which are very high readings, right? So I, I think that's the most likely scenario. I don't know what news may or may not develop between now and Monday and what they're going to do, of course, with that news. But barring news or news neutral, whatever you however you like to phrase it, right? In the absence of news, I think the most likely scenario is that if you crack below four, let's call it 410, 411. Believe it or not, the next level down, I think is 408, 409. So it's not much of a fall. Then I believe it or not, I think that there's another level near 407. So, and that's really where I've got that particular support line there. And then beneath there, we get work our way down, I think towards the 20 day SMA there in light blue that will be rising. So that's the quick and dirty on the SPY. But when you look at some of the stocks that we won't be checking out here, but in lieu of that, we'll check out the sectors. You can just see that these are really big moves. And some of these are going to look like a breakout, right? That you broke out. And I think what they're going to do is at least come back to the breakout level and then either fill the gap in the case of something like the XLC or touch that former resistance level and maybe down another percent, let's say in the XLK. And then we have to wait and see what happens from there. You know, in the way that I like to do things, I do them. I'm a big believer in dynamically drawing your support and resistance lines for short-term trading, especially, but also 
longer term as well. So I, I would draw a line right there. And if I magnify that just to show you what I do, I would wait and see. I like to look and say, well, where does that come into this line? And you can see it's a little bit below that breakout level. So that would be a little bit of kind of an overshoot there. And I really wouldn't be looking to go short this too much if the market's not rolling over as well. But certainly if it doesn't crack that support line, I would really want to see that support line get cracked before I start to really get gung-ho about trading against this intermediate trend that's been up and the slightly longer inter intermediate trend that's also been up, you know, so I'd rather see that, you know, that crack in a bigger way. Uh, but th that same, that same concept really applies where overdone still at 72 here on XLC, even after backing off and having an ugly candle. So I think there's, I think when you look at some of the sectors that were the leaders that made these moves, they do look like they're in need of a more of a breather. And that just kind of fits with how I felt about the overall market on the macro perspective. So I'm not a pound the table person, but I do think that the most likely scenario is we do at least have some kind of a pullback, maybe even a brief pullback, but some kind of a pullback in the early part of the week. And then we just have to see how things play out. But again, kind of a false breakout in XLF. Uh, you kind of you had one here. If I put a put the cursor on there, you can see the breakout level that, that, that this took out and it's coming back to it. So I think you're going to see that more than likely. And there's nothing wrong with that right now. Then it would be like, well, does this bull market behavior have more legs? Is this bull trap going to I think it could be a bull trap. Is this a bull trap that we're seeing? And are they going to make it even more impressive? And I think there's a, a good chance that they will. I just don't think they'll do it right away. I think it'll take a little bit of churning maybe in what is relatively, on a relative basis, a very slow news week relative to last week, on paper at least. Last week was chock full. There's sure where there'll be earnings coming out for sure, but you won't have the uh, the massive biggest names all grouped together. You won't have FOMC and all the fallout from that. And so I think that's important. We also noted, let's go back to a bigger chart. We also noted in macro measure, which is worth keeping an eye on. I think you should take a look at the DXY because dollar dropping, you know, stocks have been going up, dollar rising, you know, stocks typically don't fare as well. Dollar just made a sharp reversal. If it can sustain it, I don't know. It could, right? So you got to be on the lookout for that. And yields too, they also took a little bit of a turn back up after being under pressure for quite a while. Right, so keep an eye on those. Uh, VIX even kind of finally showed a pulse uh, a little bit, but after bottoming just above 17 on Thursday, uh, it then kind of worked its way back up a little bit from there. So those are just bigger things to look at. But as far as our grid goes, I think your, your leading sectors, they're the ones that are probably are going to pull back. And as far as these go, let's kind of cover them to be thorough. But... XLP, we've been noting that what's the, we've been noting XLV lost its mojo and it's just continued to continue to just trend lower slowly. So, right, there, there's really nothing special about what's happening in there yet. I mean, you'd have to really set your alerts above and below to get, to get interested in this point. Um, XLRE probably kind of flying in the face of reality. I don't know, maybe in the face of what many of us would expect, myself included, that there's some kind of a housing uh, reemergence or resurgence happening. It could be. I, I've been wrong before in terms of my macro expectations, uh, just like every other person who's ever tried to practice economics. But bottom line is, I still find it difficult to believe that things are going to roar with mortgage rates the way they are. Maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe I'm just dead wrong about that. But that's that. Now, the, another interesting thing I think we can highlight here is XLE. Uh, come on, where am I here on the positioning? XLE, I mean, this is something we probably should explore on a bigger chart too, because now we have this attempt to get back up here, low or high, coming back into support. And yeah, you're not too far away from maybe losing the next level. And then that would maybe be an even more critical level in your 83, which would be a few more percent lower. So that hasn't, that we've been noting that for a while, that that has been kind of squirrely and tough 
and it remains that way. It was looking pretty good, but you could see it petered out not being able to break out. And then they reversed that pretty hard. Uh, this, the staples really have lost their mojo. They were doing well from the October lows towards the end of the year. But when the market took on more of a bullish posture, the money I think left here and it's probably went into here, or at least some of it. And you can see the discretionary has been doing very, very well. I mean, to go from 126 to what is that one? Come on, think or swim. I'm getting like this weird little oh, 158. So there you go. That's a $32 move. Uh, that's about what? Tw not quite 25%. Um, but in the 20s, somewhere in, in the low 20s, that's a heck of a move, right, in, in just the first five weeks for an entire sector. But that's what happened. So I think that's another one where you could see how important that level was that it hesitated at near 149, 150, 148. I would think it backs up a little bit more to see if it can convert that over you know, by definitely touching it after having sprung through it. Same thing I would think here too uh, for mm, realistically, I think this is a better level down near 76. I would see if this is going to try to come back and backtrack towards there in XTN and again, try to convert it to support. And if these, if these do convert to support and then we start getting that bounce and they start to move this stuff back up, remember that's going to be, that's going to draw more and more bulls in and it, maybe the bulls will be right. Maybe there will not be a bull trap. Maybe there will just be a shift back to a bull market. But uh, I have a hard time believing that at this stage. I'm still not really in that camp. And it's not stubbornness. It's just that I still believe that there's a lot of negative economic fallout that's due. And I think what I'm going to do is draw for us here just to kind of highlight that we might have some triangular type action in here, right? Where this tri they tried to break this out. They couldn't do it. Very similar situation in XLB. You can see they're very strongly correlated of late for sure. Um, and so that is really kind of looking like a little bit of a false breakout. And now you got to see where that comes down to. But the way that that ended too, that wasn't all that impressive, right? This, this little kind of run and then right back. So it might already be effectively, if we look a little closer, it might already be at the that point where it needs to, uh, this one maybe comes in a little bit more but they're both kind of on their way back to retracing and kind of from a false breakout. So be careful if they do start pulling the rug, because if they do get a lot of breakouts to the upside and get people trapped that way, right, they could really pull things quickly. And of course, that would take my view of the SPY dropping to like 407 and then maybe 403, 404. And then you're at 400, maybe 395 in a real whoosh lower if they if they really pull the rug on people. But a lot of things popped and I think they popped too quickly, too far, too quickly, and they need to still come back a little bit. I think that's going to be the telltale sign. What happens after on the pullback, right? Is, is the pullback mild and the bulls come right back again like they have been? I mean, the behavior has really been switching over to more of a bullish bull market type behavior where in even in the face of bad news, they managed to still make things move higher, right? I mean, in the end, overall, and Friday was the exception. They tried it and they got, they got rejected and they really turned around, put a rough candle together. But XLE, just to look at it bigger picture, it's been a tough one. We've been acknowledging that. And uh, you could maybe try here and there for a little bit of money. But yeah, this is on the ropes and probably looking towards cracking that low there probably brings you down to your next few levels, right? That's at, that's at risk right now, though, if we look at it a little more closely. So I'll highlight a few sectors that I think are at risk after the, the XLE was different, but XLF with a kind of like a little bit of a mini false breakout here makes a little bit higher highs now, right? Not really impressive. So you want to see, hey, can this hold the 20? If worst case, can it hold the 50 down here in yellow? If it can't, right, that's really a problem, right? You've got this kind of two highs, probably like a weaker push this time around, I would say, and not very impressive. And you maybe even come down even further. So we just got to be nimble, but we're not at a spot where I think it's clear. I feel like we were just at the last several weeks where it's spots where certain stocks 
in certain areas were looking prime to go. And we had great bullish patterns forming and they did, you know, a lot of them did, but now I'm like, mm, I don't know. I think you're more, you're looking at a little bit more of a pullback. Um, XLY is a good example of another one. I think that's looking at more of a pullback because this just got, that's a heck of a run, right? And now getting above the 200 there in purple after that was that level itself was sort of a big deal. Then you add the 200 to the mix and then it becomes really magnetic in the sense that it should come back to there now that it's in corrective mode to see if it can test it and then go. That's what we have to wait and see. And a lot of these are going to be met by rising short term SMAs, which is preferable to declining right SMAs if you're a bull. But so that should support it should have a better chance of helping support. But we'll see because you just never know. You really don't ever know for sure. So let's take a look at that. XLC may have been the one because of the, the meta move may have been the one that was the most extreme, right? That was really up there. Uh, you get a, an RSI reading on the sector. I mean, most of the sector, I guess, is meta, but still 882 reading, right? So that's pretty darn high on RSI. Remember that most gaps fill between about four set between four to five days later in most cases. So if you're going to see a gap closure, you're more likely to see it in the four to five days that follow the gap uh, than you are, let's say, two weeks later. So not always the case, obviously, but this is just the, the uh, proclivity is after post gap. So then it could be indeterminate, like how long does this go? But most gaps that are going to fill anytime soon usually do it within the first four to five days. So that would be something to keep on guard in terms of XLC. For Meta to do that, I mean, it would take, I got to think, you know, that people are trapped big time. I don't think Meta does that in the next, since it happened uh, there, I don't think it, in the next two or, well, three or four sessions that it's going to do that. But you never know, but it could be a news event that drives that, you never know. But I don't think that happens, but yeah, any any time with gaps, I kind of look at them and think, okay, is there a chance that this is kind of bogus and we should fade this thing or not? And I kind of lose interest after a week goes by. If it hasn't really shown any proclivity or I should say interest in doing that, I kind of move on. But I'm not a big fade gap fade trader. I mean, that's I try to really go find momentum from, from breakouts more so. But uh, th that's probably a good highlight of that. We, I think we should just take a look at XLI and we should look at XLB. These look really similar, so I'm not going to spend too much time on these, but you can see they kind of just uh, e eclipse that high, those highs a little bit. That's not that impressive, right? They kind of had their moment and they've been consolidating. They've been doing a good job of consolidating. I mean, they held on to most of their games gains. If we look at, Low of say 83 to round it off in a 103. So that's that's a $20 move. And then from there, they got down as low as it looks like 90, call it 96. So they you know they've held on to it's not quite exactly 38, but they've held on to two thirds of their gains. I'm sorry, uh 62% of their gains. They've only given about the the, the 38.2 fib back. So that's pretty impressive overall, but when the market was really running, right? They because they I think they enjoyed their success sooner. Uh, they uh, they weren't able to do much, so that's not looking good right now. You'd probably want to see this thing not lose. You know the 102 level. You lose 102, you're probably back. You know you're probably back down in the midst of these SMAs, and it was kind of like a false false breakout. So nothing nothing. XLB, I'll look at it, but it's pretty much the same. I mean, it's very, very similar. So it's maybe a little bit ahead on terms of weakening. You get the idea. Slightly exceeds these highs, makes it look like, hey, it's going somewhere. And yeah, that's a breakout that just didn't have any, any oomph to it whatsoever. And I think everybody could draw a support line under this. And it's very clear that if you put, it's really at a juncture there. It's right on the precipice, I think, of being cracked. Right there, uh, you could tw uh, tweak that a little if you want, but you get the idea. And that's you know that that's ready to crack there. So I, I think that looks vulnerable. You know, in the absence of news, that probably goes down. Transports just went bonkers, you know, and I think they're vulnerable too. 
So that's what I'm seeing. A lot of vulnerability in the sectors right now after the success they had. Yet another one that, again, takes out highs. Always, if you're new to this stuff, just always try to remember that you know, when they get within striking distance, they love to just exceed something by a little bit. That there may be people trading against this as long side buyers. Hey, if it breaks here, I'm a breakout buyer. Or I'm short, I still think the market's going straight to hell in a handbasket on the express elevator. But if they get it above there a little bit, I'll finally cry uncle and, and capitulate and close my short. That's why you see these things, at least in theory, but I think it's true. I mean, I saw a lot of, in real time, I was, I don't have a lot of time to watch like tick by tick data all day long, but I did notice that they, they were liquidating, I thought, some shorts who were just capitulating and maybe new longs when, when they pushed the indices, major index ETFs beyond certain levels. It just seemed like there are a bunch of stops, just a flurry of like super, super flurry of, of orders getting triggered that really ended up hurting people that, that that had them in place, I think, in the end. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, I wanted to cover SMH. This is really important. This is what I really wanted to work towards as we start to get into the other half of the stuff we typically cover. But this is something I made, tried to make clear with these, uh, this Mickey Mouse balloon, but it's really supposed to be an inverted uh, head and shoulders highlight, right? The shadowing. and you can just see where that is. It's very clear. I wanted to make sure no one missed that. So I overdid it as usual, but I don't have like the great drawing tools that I wish I had in here and I can't hand draw too well. So it's tough, but uh, you can see that. And why I bring this up is because A, this is a really important sector. We cover it every week. B, right, it also did the old Right, put put the screws to all the people trading against highs, and you can see it barely exceeded things right there, even right. They they're just great at it, and that's what they did. And then they brought let it come back in. But you know, that that's a very there's a lot of very bullish patterns like this across the market. And that's good. I mean, that's potentially very good. And if they fire this market, if they fire and kind of meet their measured move objective or destiny. It really means great things in the future, right? Where you should really work our way back very close to the highs or maybe exceed them in some cases. But, you know, the old but that everyone knew was coming. But I think you, if you're experienced, you know that there's a lot of patterns that just fail to fire or they draw people in, then they reverse, right? So you can, that's the thing about the market. It's really hard to be uber comfortable at any given time, because even if you have high confidence, you're still not at 100% because you can't be. So you still have to sit there and say, well, I got to play this thing smartly. I got to manage this thing smartly. That's the thing. They could try to fulfill this a little bit more. And I think they just may do that. They try. They could try to get this looking like, yeah, this thing's firing. It'll draw a lot more people in. It could push things more than you expect. But Again, in the end, I think it could be one of those patterns that pulls people in and fails to really go all the way to. Now, that's more of a macro econ take. So I don't want anyone to think I'm seeing that in the charts themselves. I'm just looking at the big picture macro econ and saying and interest rates being where they are and how important those are in so many ways to the modern American banana republic economy that we've got on our hands. And with all that being factored in, that's what I'm saying. But right now, this is an inverted head and shoulders that's gotten a little bit ahead of itself in the short run. If it pulls back, finds support and goes, that could trigger some serious buying because we're not the only players out there, right, that are spotting these things. A lot of people do. A lot of people like head and shoulders patterns. As popular as they are, they actually do, I think, have a pretty good track record uh, over the course of time. So you have to respect them. Other people were just going to say, I don't see that. I see more of kind of like a sharp cup and this kind of big kind of ornate handle. Whatever you see in here right now, it's bullish. If you saw that uh, triangle, which I'll take, the, I'll take this away. You saw the triangle that I had drawn there, you know, in orange. That was more of an ascending triangle. That's bullish. You kind of have this, uh, this, uh, channel that's opening up here, this uptrending channel now that looks like it's making new highs with higher lows, and certainly took out it certainly took out its own highs that it made on the way up from here. 
So there's a lot of bullish stuff happening there. Clearly, the performance of a lot of these components within the SMH was tremendous. We were fortunate enough to have several of those names, including NVIDIA and, and AMD um, in, in the services, and they made incredible moves, you know, and, and that's that's great. But those are just trades, right? We're not locking onto those for the long haul. We're just trying to catch those really big pops if we can and then move on and try to do it all over again. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's really something that bears watching, I think. Just something worth keeping your eye on. This sector's always, I think, worth keeping your eye on, really. But yeah, definitely the big one to watch to see if that goes into failure mode after kind of faking a breakout, or if they can keep that going, that's probably going to pull, that could that could pull a lot along with it. Here's another one we look at. It's not on the main grid. And you can see that this XHB, you know, this got pretty darn extreme. I mean, if we look at the RSI reading, that's on that day and it closed off the high, but it was probably 77 intraday on the daily before it backed off a little bit. And that's that's extreme. You know, that's a really, really extreme reading for uh, that sector in my mind. But that's they've got themselves somehow, I guess, talked into the fact that rates are going to start working their way down quickly. And I guess, but, uh, you know, I think that's, again, I think they're front running a lot of really bullish developments or positive developments that haven't, I don't think that those developments are written in stone that they're going to happen. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty for more, more so than the market. But again, when we're trading the ultimate, you know, the ultimate say is had by the price of the, of the equity or the, the ETF in this case. And, you know, it was a great opportunity in there. I think we had a trade on in, something in housing. I can't remember which one that was. XAU, we were starting to get a little, I think, wishy-washy on this thing the last couple of weeks. And it might have been kind of just the fact that, right, we talked about, I think, getting outside of the Bollinger's a little bit, but still in an uptrend. And we put this line in here and said, you know, what do we do? What if it can't hold there? And it didn't, you know, and that's the thing, like, this is a tough sector. I'm hoping, and I don't, you know, of course, I don't root against anyone, any rebels positions or anything like that, but I'm hoping that this gives me another chance to buy lower. I was lucky enough to be buying, you know, last summer. I was loading up on the physical and other things, but I'm not really in those for the trade. Um, I could have been, I guess, but I'm not trying to flip physical. And I do have some some ETFs as well that I'm long, but I'm really more or less in those because as a hedge, you know, because I'm I'm very concerned and I I love to lose on them. I love to buy more at an even lower level and lose on them, frankly. But that's that's the unique part of a hedge, right? It's sort of like life insurance. You really don't want it to work in your favor. <laughs> I don't really want these hedges to work in my favor because all the rest of the stuff I've got uh is going to more than compensate for me taking a uh, beating in the precious metals i just think it's a prudent thing to have some of and i i try to always keep some something and i decided to go bigger with physical uh this time around but this could be forming that there's really clearly like a cup with maybe a handle this could also turn out to be an even bigger cup with a handle that may form so i don't want to get i'm kind of like bullishly bearish if you know what i mean I want it to become a bull, but after it's suffered a really severe bear phase, but I, I don't know if I'll get my wish, but I think it was good that we spotted that and we're a little like, eh, you know, this is not really, this is a little worrisome. And I'll tell you what, one of the telltale signs was there just wasn't this massive rash of paper in UOA. When we saw prior jam jobs like this one, and we saw this one in UOA Pro, there was more across the board buying, especially here. Uh, this one, there was some, we got involved in some, but it, it was more of a reasonable number of, of trades or ideas, more so than, you know, pretty much buy anything. So that was, that was kind of good. You know, that was kind of good there uh, that we kind of sidestepped that. Now I'll take a look at, let's see if we can do copper, lumber. Here's our copper. And we talked about this and there was no denying that, you know, copper it just kind of started doing its thing. And we were uh, like, wow, you know, this is this is kind of surprising that it's able to really do this and break out. 
but it did. But you can see right there, it's outside of the Bollinger's and you can see the RSI readings are down here, right? So this, we noted that that was getting a little, oh man, like kind of like the, the other, pre the precious metals. And you can see what, the, what happens there. So a lot of people, uh, a lot of people don't run Bollinger bands. I, I, I don't think, and I, I would tell you that I think they're worth it. Do they really trigger trades for me? No, they, they don't. I use other techniques for that, but I like to be able to look at something and saying like, look, put it in, again, put it within context. Is this stretch from the 100 day, you know, very easily. And, you know, this became stretched and the RSI told you that it was very stretched and, you know, it had a tremendous run. If you put it all together, you, you got to start being cautious up there. You've got to manage your position with a more defensive hand. And these are things that they just become second nature when you do this stuff for a while. So uh, I don't want to editorialize about technical analysis too much, but I do think that if you're new, it can't help hurt you to play around on one layout, to play around with um, the uh the Bollinger bands for a little while I set them up like John Bollinger set them up just coincidentally I didn't even know that John ran the 100 SMA on his and he stuck with the two standard deviations but apparently he I found out later in some article that I read that I because I didn't I didn't like them set to 20 like most platforms default I liked them with more of a longer term setting and uh it's just interesting that he did that as well Here's lumber, right? And this would sort of tell you that maybe, right, this is vulnerable soon. And if it is, right, it would probably come back and start to trace back towards this 20 the area here near 451, which would be a decent drop if that were to happen uh, near the, uh, sorry, 20 and the 100 there in dashed, dashed white and gray. So if that does sort of transpire where that breaks that and then starts coming back in a little bit, that would make sense also kind of from a support and resistance perspective somewhere near there. And if that's the case, I mean, that that XHB, I mean, I would wonder how the XHB with, with rates going back up and uh, with uh, lumber rolling over, I would wonder how long XHB could stay up for, but who am I to say? And then finally, I should, I should come up with a new format. I, Ryan and I have been talking about it, but I think this CL we should look at when we look at XLE. I, I kind of have so many thoughts I'd like to share that I don't even necessarily get to all of them. And sometimes they're not really in order. And I apologize for that. Just so many thoughts I'd like to share. And uh, I can't do it. He's trying to keep these videos for any kind of reasonable time frame. But you can see this. I mean, look at that. You know, that that's right back again. We've been watching this for a while. We started saying it was looking better. And it was, but you can see, like, that's why I run these. I'm not a big fan of these in terms of, hey, the 100 cross the 200, it's time to buy, or the 50. I'm not big into the golden crosses and the, you know, all that kind of Hindenburg stuff. I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying it's just not something I do a lot of. And, you know, here it is that just, again, it worked its way up to the 100 and just couldn't fight through. And there was other resistance there, right? So when you have price action, right, natural support and resistance there. And you also have an SMA, the kind of confluence area. It sort of doubles up, right, on the resistance there. And they just, in my mind, the way I look at it anyway. And then when you crack below the 10 day there in white on that day there, the 27th, it's been down ever since. And so now you're testing the recent lows and what happens now? Are we got to see if it can hold here for the third time near these levels or if it's going to plumb even lower lows and maybe there's a lot of trap people in there. Now we talked about that way back when that we felt as though this trade was getting crowded and that was maybe a lucky, lucky way to phrase it. But because I really do think that it, it turned out to be that way that a lot of people had themselves convinced that we we're going to be doing so much better and, and the stocks were kind of like leading and maybe they, maybe they will get it, get, redo it again. But, if you look at just where the oil futures are versus XLE, this this to me, I I, I just keep thinking that it, I, I'm willing to go with it and all that, but I keep thinking it really should be lower because of the way the oil future keeps behaving. I am not an oil market expert or anything like that, though. But to me, like this is on the verge of coming down and testing 
the 150, 200 right there. Now, Think or Swim did the old switcheroo on me to percentages, but that would be down in near 8150. So it would be down several more percent, 81, 850, 82 range. And that would be down several more percent. And no matter how you look at it, right now, you're still maintaining the trend. I, I'll give bulls that, but you know, you get the lower high put in versus here. Um, not really an impressive breakout attempt or re retest. They didn't, they weren't able to do much, get even get back up there. The, the, the crude is lower, the left gaps on the way up. And it looks to me like it's almost right, a fade to complete. I don't want to get too strong, but I'll tell you, if I see some bearish paper or paper that I think could be a hedge for some folks that are shorting this, I'd be willing to entertain those ideas in UOA Pro in less than a nanosecond because a lot of these things keep confirming that this this may have been your false breakout attempt or just your latest failure. And I feel like this is, I feel like for some reason this wants to come back to here and just see what happens. That's kind of what I've been thinking for a while, but I just can't, it just hasn't happened. I mean, it just hasn't fallen all the way to there. But I think with the with with crude looking like this, I just got to wonder how long before it gives up another three or four percent. The XLE that is that I'm talking about. How this is? I've been been thinking that, but we'll see. I mean, that's been kind of one of those things that's a little, a little bit of a strange development in a way where that you would think that there'd be a little bit more heaviness in those oil names, but there just hasn't been here before, and there could be more finally showing up now. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But yeah, I think that's a good review of a lot of the things we typically look at. And I'm sorry about the, uh, you know, the, this, the time factor. I lost a lot of time trying to scramble to find some proof that there was a recording somewhere, but I just didn't get I didn't get anywhere. I could not find my recording of my original macro measure, and that just set me back a ton of time. So doing the best I can. And my final mention is to say the same thing, but probably longer. Uh, I'm not ever really pushing services, but I kind of feel like it's maybe a time to break the precedent and just tell folks, at least inquire about it, at least maybe take a trial of UOA Pro, uh, because this has been this has been remarkable trading so far this year. We thought it was going to be a good trading year. It started off incredibly um, there's been a ton of opportunity. UOA Elite team's been finding just, I think, uncovering great UOA hits for us to whittle down and find opportunities. And I don't want to go through them, but uh, and you, you may not even know how it works. But of course, if you took a trial, you could go back, take a look at all the ideas we've thrown in here and just note how big some of these moves have been. And that's the thing. You've got to, as they say, you've got to be in it to win it. And there's just been so many incredible moves and i feel like some of our folks are taking advantage of them some of the folks are rolling and really taking advantage of them with incredible returns that are really reminiscent of the second half of 2020 after the seven nine or eleven trillion dollars got injected into the economy so to speak uh depending on what measure you want to go by what source whatever but the bottom line is that it's been remarkable and uh, this is never really something that you can expect all year long. But if we can have a really good start to the year and this continues, it's really it should be a great year, both as bulls and bears. And I think we're we're going to be able to trade over the course of this year. I think we're going to be able to trade as bulls and bears and get some really tremendous moves. So I just wanted to mention that Dirk talked about AI. You know, Dirk talked about Carvana, I think coin. We had so many moves, CRM, Qualcomm, the index ETFs, SI, NVIDIA, AMD, Piton, FedEx. Most of these were bullish movement, of course, based on the way stocks have been acting. But uh, I'm just saying it's just been a great year so far. And I think that it's it's it might be worth it to check into that. And even if you don't stay after 30 days, you say, no, it's not for me. It's too active, not active enough whatever the case may be, you can at least see how it works. And that way, if you get interested again, when things really heat up, you could maybe jump into it. So I just wanted to pass that along. Didn't get a chance to talk about that to the extent that I really wanted to, but uh, it's been, uh, there's been a, just a ton of opportunity and we're just grateful for that because 
when the market is this active and it's delivering this kind of movement, these are the best days, right? You've got to really take advantage of times like this because it's not always like this. It's not always as robust as it has been lately. So just wanted to pass that along. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope something that I share with you helps you out this week or in the future. And I'll be in touch through our webinars and updates and all the other stuff that we do all week long. Thanks for tuning in.